Zupancic, welcome in uh, to Machine Heads to talk a little bit about the uh, latest compact loaders uh, from John Deere. Uh, Greg, how you doing today, man? Pretty good, Wayne. Thank you for the opportunity. Good to see you again. Yeah, man. Good to see you too. Um, so yeah, let's let's jump right in here on these uh, these new Deere uh, 334 and 335 P tier uh, compact loaders. Before we get into kind of uh, some of the the details on these machines, I did want to kind of start off. Just kind of talking about the the, the overall trends uh, in uh, in compact loaders uh, in general because it's a, it's a really interesting um, kind of segment of the market uh, with how big compact equipment has really been here in the last several years uh, in general and how that's heated up. Um, you know, I think a lot of that momentum is can definitely be placed at the feet of or the tracks of uh, of the of the compact loaders and and what they've got going on. So, yeah, I mean. Uh, I guess my first question to you is, you know, from your perspective um, within uh, John Deere, you know, how has the demand uh, or or the use uh, of of compact loaders, uh, compact track loaders, and skid steers uh, changed in the last five or ten years? How would you kind of uh, describe the differences in which people are using those machines now, and kind of what they're hoping to get out of them now uh, versus about ten years ago? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question to start off. I appreciate that. Um, there's a few things that I that come to mind for me. Um, obviously, it's a very dynamic industry, so it's it's ever changing. But um, you know, driven by innovation and things like that. But really, um, skid steers and compact track loaders, they've become the dominant entry level product form for customers that want to get into the construction, you know, residential and commercial building business, uh, landscaping. And um, because of the demand there, even the rental segment of the market um, purchases a, a tremendous amount of these machines. Um, compact track loaders are about an 80,000 unit market annually all of new equipment sold and skid steers would add about another 25,000. So um, that that's you know one of the biggest industries it's, uh, that it's ever been, obviously one of the bigger industries in all of construction. Um, and um, the reasons are, I think, that you asked, are the price point, right? The versatility with the, all the attachments that are available, uh, the compactness to fit into tight places, um, and also trailer behind an average um, size pickup truck to get to the next job site. It, it, they provide a great return on investment because of those attributes for the customer. And I, I would just add um, lastly that there's also numerous examples of how these machine forms over the you know, last bunch of years have replaced larger equipment. So customers um, have opted to buy these more capable um, and uh, machines with all those attributes I mentioned. Um, they've been cannibalizing um, traditional backhoes, um, wheel loaders, agricultural tractors, and more recently, we're seeing them replace small dozers and motor graders because they can now be equipped with things like grade control technologies and um, uh, also, you know, grading attachments on the front of these machines. Yeah, I mean, and, and part of that kind of goes into my my next question here, obviously, you know, with with this increased capability and the increased, uh, uh, you know, ability to compatibility with with larger uh, tools and high flow attachments and stuff like that. Um, you know, the, the machines are getting larger, uh, the, the skid steers and, and CTLs themselves are actually getting larger to kind of, uh, you know, fit these, these more powerful tools and the, the applications that, you know, customers are, are wanting to use them in. So yeah, wh what do you think was the, was the really the cause of that? Is it, um, w was it just kind of how versatile these machines were to begin with and kind of customers looking to use them in even more, um, kind of applications, um, what, what, what kind of led to, you know, this demand for larger and larger skid steers and compact track loaders? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And like you said, it, um, the versatility is one of the main keys, but, um, they're wanting, you know, customers are asking for more capability. They want to get jobs done faster and they want to be, um, get those jobs done more efficiently by pushing more, lifting more, grinding, cutting, spreading, or even digging more in less time, right? You can, you know, you can do that with a more capable machine platform. So maybe a little larger machine that you can house, um, you know, more hydraulic performance, maybe house more engine horsepower to drive that hydraulic performance. You know, the key to note here, though, 
is you have to keep um, the compactness um, as you get bigger and you put in those attributes of higher performing hydraulic components, you got to cool it. Um, so, um, you know, that's important as well. But you got to keep that a compactness that has been driving the industry growth and creating demand. You need that lower ground pressure still. Um, uh, you need to still be able to trailer these machines uh, behind, like I said, a, you know, a, a, a average size pickup truck. Um, and, and then, um, you know, by definition, um, it is no longer um, a versatile piece of equipment if you get too large. So that, that's, that's something that we have here at John Deere. And, and, and obviously in our construction and forestry division, if somebody wants a really big, um, bigger machine with more capability, we have a line of dozers, right? We have large wheel loaders, we have large locomotor right. graders. And so um, we're very passionate about trying to create more performance in, um, in a machine size that customers um, still can um, claim a good return on that investment with the versatility. Yeah, there, there's definitely a line of kind of diminishing returns there, uh, for sure, whenever you're talking about, uh, you know, the, these machines just getting larger and larger. Uh, at, at a certain point, it just makes more sense to go ahead and move up to a, to a full-size machine, depending on what you're doing. Um, but yeah, I do want to get back to that kind of that design uh, quandary uh, and that, that kind of puzzle for you guys to kind of figure out a little bit later on as we get more into the 334 and the 335 uh, in terms of making sure they're not uh, too big. Um, but before we get there, uh, you know, we, we, we mentioned this briefly a little bit ago, but, you know, high flow hydraulics. Um, I mean, do you consider that one of the major drivers uh, with kind of like the the overall growth or maybe even the trend with these machines getting getting larger and larger? Uh, would you would you kind of characterize it that way that the machines are getting larger to fit these larger tools? And so therefore, uh, high flow hydraulics are becoming more important. T talk a little bit about you know, why high flow hydraulics are, are, are so key now on yeah. these machines. Sure. The, we have seen, um, attachments, um, that are becoming available on the market, um, getting, you know, getting larger, uh, requiring more hydraulic capability to be able to run them efficiently and things like that. But really, I mean, we've seen internally, we've seen our take rate of high flow option more than double in the past five years. Um, you know, wow. some of that is, you know, from a customer economics perspective, high flow, you know, simply helps with resale value. It offers that customer that may buy it in the future, or even the customer who owned the machine originally, purchased the machine originally, some flexibility to diversify the applications or the segment or the, uh, the type of application that they might want to go into. Um, it helps customers with that flexibility um, to get into those different applications by opening up opportunities to do um, larger jobs potentially, um, you know, to run uh, more demanding attachments, like I said. And, f and so some examples of that are, um, you know, land, clear land clearing with um, larger mulchers on the front of these machines, Gr you know, m uh, attachments that can grind up asphalt uh, with a coal planer attachment. Um, the drum can be bigger. So instead of, you know, a traditional 20, 24 inch coal planer, I mean, um, customers are asking for um, coal planers that can go up to 40 inches in, in width um, so they can wow. make less passes, right? And, um, you know, things like trenching. You can trench deeper um, into the ground for irrigation and things like that with um, a more capable hydraulic system. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and it's it, it really is kind of incredible, how, you know, how much uh, capability that, you know, these larger CTLs and skid steers uh, are really capable of, um, yeah. And and let's get into the specifics there on the three thirty four and three thirty five. You know, I, I know that when you guys uh, introduced these machines at at Con Expo, one of the things that you said was, you know, that that both of these machines are really uh, direct answers from John Deere to to customer requests for for more power, uh, better hydraulic capabilities, uh, larger size, everything that we've been kind of talking about so far uh, from Deere skids, Deers, and compact track loaders. Um, so I, I think my first question for you guys here is, you know, why did you decide to kind of develop two new machines, the 334 and 335, instead of just kind of increasing the power and the hydraulic capabilities of, of the machines that were already there, the 333 and the 332G? Why, why did these machines need to, to be larger? Yeah. And so, um, like I mentioned earlier, 
we think it's really important not to get much bigger dimensionally so you can keep the key attributes that define a compact piece of equipment. And um, it's the main reason we've seen such massive growth. We, um, we as a, a design team, engineering team, um, we want to always offer a machines that are nimble, quick, have low ground pressure, fit into tight places and can move um, easily from job site to job site on a standard trailer. Um, so for us, the 334 and 335, they didn't get any wider or taller. Um, they didn't lose ground clearance, for example. Um, we did get um, a few inches longer. Uh, we had to be able to put larger coolers in the 34 and 35, um, which would be different than the coolers we would have put on a 32 and, and 34. Um, and maybe it got, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, th uh, 33, 32 and 33. And maybe yeah. they got um, 200 pounds heavier or so. Um, but where we focused our attention was on the hydraulic system to run some of the newest and most sophisticated attachments in the industry, like I mentioned. Um, and where we spent a lot of that time was meticulously designing that system with a sophisticated, more sophisticated than the, th the current 332 and 33 have. Um, we, we put in a, uh, what we call a PCLS um, acronym, but it stands for Pressure Compensating Load Sensing Hydraulic System. That pump um, will only run as fast as needed, where um, on the 32 and 33 today, it's an open centered system. And that open centered system, that pump runs as fast as your engine RPMs are. So it's um, it's just always moving. It's taking up a lot of fuel and things like that with the with the load sensing system. It knows how much load is needed depending on the given attachment. It will only spin as fast as uh, needed based on our software logic. Um, to, and, and you get a, a quite a few good attributes to that. So um, so, you know, for example, um, to get the better, uh, the better attachment productivity, um, we're able to improve our fuel economy because that pump isn't running full speed all, all time, at all times. Um, we can improve our multifunction machine, um, multifunction capability of the machine. So if you're dumping a lot of flow with an open centered system that, like I said, we have on our current production, um, you, you tend to lose things like strength to raise the boom, hydraulic strength, or maybe to counter rotate while you're um, running an attachment um, at full speed and it's taking a lot of auxiliary flow with it. It also, um, this hydraulic system also provides um, a significantly or noticeable hydraulic noise level change. It, it's reduced over an open centered system. Some might say open centered systems um, under load um, have a more of objectionable um, uh, noise sound, uh, maybe like a hydraulic whine. I hear that often. And, um, you know, that that makes customers maybe less comfortable for long periods of operation. And these folks that are going to be running these bigger attachments for more productivity, obviously the return on investment is to, um, you know, to be able to get the job done quicker. Um, but also um, they're gonna be sitting, they're gonna use it as their primary source of revenue typically with the expense of the attachments that go on the front. So they're gonna be running them logically um, long periods of operation. So, so they want um, some economic benefits out of that. And, the, and they're typically um, things like, you know, oper being comfortable, um, also being able to get the job done quicker and also, um, you know, being effective at, the job that they do every day. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, with the, with this new hydraulic platform, and we've got we've got more available power, but but also um, you know less fuel consumption uh, because of that variability in there. Yeah, I, I um, might I might not have mentioned, um, but we're measuring about twenty percent better fuel economy with a wow. um, with this uh, three thirty four three thirty five. Um, I'll, I'll just use the acronym again: PCLS hydraulic system. Um, over the open centered hydraulic system, which is a more cost effective hydraulic system, but it, it won't provide the capabilities that we needed in order to move the envelope uh, um, dial, if you will. Right. So a little, little bit more uh, upfront cost, but um, but but longer term, you're going to have the the major those 20 percent fuel savings yeah. out, of, out of these machines. Yep, correct. 
And and in terms of like the the specifics on uh, on this this new PCLS system, um, you know the the specs in general. Like, what are we looking at there? I know up to about up to thirty five hundred psi hydraulic system pressure, uh, twenty five gallon per minute standard hydraulic flow, forty four gallon per minute high flow. Um, you know, I, I know one of the things that I think is really interesting about this whole kind of a, a equation uh, with the, the improvements that you were just talking about to the hydraulics, the improvements to system pressure uh, and auxiliary flow, flow, you know, all of those improvements kind of added together uh, amount to more hydraulic horsepower. Tell us a little bit about how that kind of how those improvements kind of work and how, you know, what hydraulic horsepower really means and an increase in that to uh, to your to your capability on the site. Yeah, sure. Um, so, the first, let me let me just step back a few a uh, few paces here. The so so the three thirty three of the future, we also have put that PCLS system in that model as well as the okay. three thirty four and the three thirty five. The th the differentiation there is the three thirty three will have a, a system pressure of 3,500 PSI, and the 334 and 335 of the future will have 4,000 PSI hydraulic system pressure. Um, okay. And there will be some differences in the gallons per minute. I think it, off the top of my head, I think the 333 is going to have something like um, 42 gallons per minute, which is more than what we have today. And the 34 and 35 will have... 44 gallons per minute of high flow capability and um, pressure plus flow equals hydraulic horsepower and to do that you need to have um, uh, more to do the, the those kind of specifications you need to have um, a strong engine horsepower in order to drive that system and um, really um, receive the benefit on the front end of that attachment if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a perfect segue into the engine kind of conversation here. Um, the, the engine is rated at 118 horsepower, which is roughly about an 18% increase uh, over the engine that was in the 332 and 333. Um, can you tell us, is, is that a new engine or did you guys basically get more power out of the existing engine? Yeah, um, we did get more power out of the existing engine um, and that's how we did it. So um, the engine we've been using is proven um, we've had those in the market from our history of the current G series um, going on, you know, I think going on um, close to eight years. So we, yeah. we know and trust that engine. We just didn't need it before when, with the open centered system and having a, a 3450 PSI hyd uh, hydraulic system as well as lower gallons per minute of flow. And you could do that fairly effectively with 100 horsepower. But to, to move it to the next level, we need we did need to um, increase our horsepower. So I, I should also mention our 333 is going from 100 rated um, gross horsepower to 108. So you get a bump okay. there if you're a 333 owner. Um, um, but if you want to move up to the next level of hydraulic performance, the 34 and 35 are at that 118 horsepower, um, which at the end of the day means more productivity. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that increase in engine horsepower really focused on, uh, you know, amounting to, to more of that hydraulic horsepower. Uh, and again, kind of going uh, back to the, the tools on this machine. Um, one of the qu other questions that I did have is, you know, you mentioned kind of customers are even now looking for, you know, larger cold planer attachments, larger barrels on, on those machines. So could you tell us a little bit about what are some of the other things that you're seeing on the, on the side uh, of the tool side of things uh, in terms of, um, you know, what are some of the more popular ones? I think we mentioned, you know, some of the coal playing, the forestry attachments, stuff like that. Um, but uh, what are maybe some ones we don't know about yet that you guys are seeing uh, kind of customers gravitate toward uh, and use more and more on, on these machines? Yeah, um, I, I didn't mention, you know, um, your, your mind um, can go wild with um, things that you could do that you couldn't before um, and things that are um, in the process of being invented, right, that we haven't seen yet um, in terms of, um, you know, that would that could be uh, more effective with more power or a larger attachment. Um, 
there are some, uh, you know, there are mowers, for example, mowing attachments to, um, for cutting brush along roadways, things like that. So you can, you can um, invent larger diameter rotary cutters um, to do some land clearing on the ground if you're not mulching the trees first, you know, or um, you could, um, you know, from a coal planer perspective, I don't think 40 inches is um, where it's going to stop. I think there's going to be demand in the future for, you know, you 50, 60 inch, you know, width, a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, asphalt sidewalks and things like that are a right around some of those sizes and so you could re, you know patch and repair um, these bike paths and things like that so um, those would be just a couple examples and I did mention um, you know larger trenchers uh, the larger trench largest trencher that I know today is five feet um, in depth but why not six feet in the future or maybe even deeper um, if um, there are applications for something like that yeah, it, it, I do want to get back to as well, you know, as we talk about the potential of even larger tools, um, do you guys feel pretty good about the the size of of these machines in terms of like, I guess, looking forward to the future? You you mentioned earlier, like, we're going on about eight years now with the, the 333G um, and how well that has really uh, met customers' needs. And, you know, it was the perfect kind of companion machine for, for putting grade control on uh and with smart grade and everything um and so with these machines being a little bit larger i mean do you guys feel what why, i guess why did you decide like how did you guys know that that was kind of like the 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 perfect size the the not too big the goldilocks solution for this not too big but not too small yeah um some of that is driven by understanding what the regulations are relative like to cdls um, for example, you know, for example, if we got if we got one inch wider, like I said, we didn't get wider, we didn't get taller, we didn't lose any ground clearance. But if we got one inch wider, we no longer could fit our our track loaders on a standard trailer between the wheel hubs. So okay. then 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 the customer has to think of other ways to transport that machine, like a low boy. And and guess what? A low boy requires a CDL, and you have to pay a professional trucker to bring it from job site to job site. And so, you know, some of those things played into our logic and um, how we decided to navigate. We did get a little longer, as I mentioned. We did get a little heavier, a couple hundred pounds heavier. That gives us some better capacity for lifting um, versus 333 today um, or a 332 today um, with a couple hundred pounds more weight um, in order to you know, handle the load forces on the front of the machine with heavier attachments and things like that. But for the most part, um, we, we, we pretty much stayed in within the envelope that we needed, um, to, yeah. you know, to keep people looking our way when it comes to their purchasing decisions for their compact equipment needs. Yeah, we we've spent a lot of time talking about kind of like the the larger size, obviously these machines, the the expanded tool capabilities of these machines, and so with all of that, um, you guys have uh, these 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 machines kind of represent the the very first kind of um, you know correct me if I'm wrong on this, but uh, that they're kind of like the very first machines to kind of transition into uh, the new performance tiering uh, that you guys uh, actually announced in 2021. Uh, we're starting to kind of see, you know, the very first machines uh, gain these new these new badges uh, that kind of indicate uh, kind of where they fall in the lineup. Now, both the 334 and the 335 are classified uh, as as P tier machines. Um, give us a um, give us a bit of a refresher on on performance tiering, what that means within John Deere, and and tell us a little bit about what the P tier signifies. Uh, and why these new uh, compact loaders kind of fit that P tier uh, uh, branding? Sure, um, so a lot of that is just because um, if you look at so so we're a little different in terms of um, you know versus other products that we have in our construction and forestry portfolio. So, in, in when it comes to like skid steers and track loaders, it's it's primarily a North America product form, and and in North America, we you know our customers um, demand um, 
you know, a certain level of quality and durability and performance. And so therefore, that's why we are um, with our lineup are really P. So there's there's actually three um, that John Deere will transition to for all their construction and forestry products, or at least construction products, I should say. Um, it's G would be one um, letter uh, for kind of the economic a, a economy kind of um, platform where you don't really, you just want something that, that's going to be durable and can get the job done, but at a, a, at a pretty lower, a much lower price point, obviously. And then you have a P tier as what we're talking about and what we're really good at. We build our machines here in the United States in Dubuque, Iowa, and, um, you know, we're really good at making performance um, level equipment. Um, it, for North America customers. And then there's an X tier. And an X tier is um, is is kind of um, set, set aside for the next generation of um, powertrain and hydraulic um, technology. So that could be an X tier, um, could be a battery electric, it could be a hybrid electric. It, it, could, it would be something that's unique and new to the industry in terms of powertrain and hydraulics. Um, I, I would say we're more likely, given that we cater, we build here and we cater to um, North America customer base. It's not to say that we don't ship um, our machines to other markets. We do have a footprint in Latin America. Uh, we do have a footprint in um, you know places like Australia and New Zealand and, and other, other parts of the world. But um, I would say the vast majority of everything we sell is right in North America. And that, those are, um, traditionally P tier type customer base in terms of their expectations. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to be that clear, but back to the original point um, and question is our other products, if you think about it, we like loaders, we have larger footprint. There's more demand for wheel loaders um, outside of North America. So, and, and those needs in places like Brazil, for example, um, those customer needs want G tier level products. They don't want to pay for all the bells and whistles. They do want it to be durable, but they want a low price point. And so those would be more designed for that G tier type customer and market. And then we have in our wheel loader lineup, we do have P tier. And we also, um, we do have an X tier. We have a hybrid electric loader. And so that performance tiering is really more uh, fit more fit some of the other products in our product line than it does for what we're doing with our manufacturing pr footprint with our products here. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, just it, it, most of these machines are really going to be classified P tier uh, moving moving forward. Uh, and uh, just with the, the way that customers are using them and the, what they kind of expect out of these machines in terms of uh, both that mix of durability quality with uh with with the performance and the features that that they're coming to expect and i i do want that's a good segue uh for talking a little bit about uh some of these uh the bells and whistles that the the g uh tier machines don't have but as p tier machines these 334 and 335 have um some significantly nice kind of like comfort and uh, convenience features through technology um and i think a good uh you know way to kind of kick that off is talking a little bit about the cab uh, the, both of these loaders have redesigned uh, cabs, um, and I understand that the sealing uh, and pressur pressurization of both of these cabs has been improved. It's a it's a one piece design. Uh, take us through the improvements, uh, both uh, on the kind of like the structurally uh, from that pressurization and uh, sealing standpoint on on the cab, and both inside the cab uh, as well with some of the new uh, convenience and technology features. Yeah. Um, sure. Thank you for that opportunity as well. The the um, cab today is sort of a two piece um, design, so it's important that you can take a couple bolts bolts out and roll the cab back, so you can get into the underneath the cab and and do maintenance or repairs easily, without a lot of non value added labor to get it done. Um, and so that's important. Um, but one of the negatives of having the floor stay there and then you have the top of the cab kind of bolt down to the floor, um, there's a lot of gaps in that design. Um, our, our machines in the market today, they, they do have some industry-leading pressurization. 
if you compare versus some of our competitors, um, you know, and, and, and things like that. But with this one piece design, the floor essentially, it's a, it's one, it's a single weld mint. And so that's why we call it one piece. So when you roll back the cab, the floor comes with it. It's all, it's, it's a one piece design. So um, that's ultimately the best way to seal that cab. It's the best way to keep dust and debris out. It's the best way to keep noise levels to a minimum to help our customers be, you know, more productive and comfortable throughout the day. Yeah, and um, I th th there's uh, more visibility uh, in this cab as well, more kind of isolation from from the main frame and less vibration and noise. Um, tell us a little bit about that structural design um, on, on the visibility. How did you guys increase visibility within the cab? Yeah, thanks. Um, that that also was an outcome of of you know, kind of being able to design the um, structure all in one um, part number, if you will. Um, but yeah, that gave us some more glass that that we could put in there. Um, we could cut out part of the um, of the the cab weldment. We could cut out um, and put you know cut out steel and put glass in that area so you could see the tracks better or the tires to the ground better than you can today underneath the boom when the boom is all the way down like say you're grading the boom stays down and and um you know you can see that ground area that's really a critical area for customers so they don't run up alongside curbs or you know maybe um, um, rub their tracks against the wall and wear them out or damage them and things like that so um, that 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 was one of the outcome um, the cab is can also be isolated better and so if you want to keep vibration out we were we were with our current design you're able to you could isolate the top part of the cab, but the part where the vibration comes in is like um, on the floor where you're sitting and, and your controls are mounted to the bottom half of the cab, um, uh, or, uh, you know, maybe not mounted, but coupled to the bottom of the right. cab. So by being able to do the whole one piece, um, you can isolate everything, you know, your, your seat, your feet, um, all of that is isolated with, you know, rubber um, isolators, um, they're bigger rubber isolators. And so that vibration and noise, um, vibrating noise is improved with this design. Um, yeah. And so, you know, there's some other great features along with it, but that really would cover some of the attributes of the one piece that I can think of. Yeah. And, uh, new, new joystick controls as well. Tell us about what's, uh, what's different with those. Yeah, thanks for asking that as well. Um, it reminds me, um, part of, part of the reason for the new joysticks is as these um, attachments that are getting bigger, they're also getting more complex, and there's more popularity in attachments that need um, more than just six-way um, controls, like angles. Um, some of the attachments that are out there, like um, you know, if you if you did a greater blade, um, for example, on the front of these machines, um, you you need more more control, more angles, eight-way controls, um, very popular. And so we, and we, you know, we wanted that all of those systems to be on our joysticks. And so we had to um, develop um, new joysticks that have more capability with more buttons um, and be able to let operators keep working without having to maybe take their hand off the controls and then hit a toggle switch so they can get that eight-way control, for example. Um, and, and really, that's what drove that um, more than anything is the demand for new and larger and more complex attachments. And, and so you could control those things all, um, all on your hands without having to remove them at any time. Yeah, and, and another big uh, benefit of, of the new cab, too, is this new 8-inch touchscreen display. There's, um, there's a lot to talk about here uh, in terms of the, the features. What, what is new about this new touch display? Yeah, so um, on the G-Series, we had, uh, you know, very robust, um, very economic um, designed. Um, didn't have a lot of, it didn't have a, it, you know, it had some deficiencies, um, you know, in terms of, you know, customer interaction um, and being able to understand. So if we had, let's say we had a um, diagnostic code error that popped up today, um, it would shoot out a number, like a number. Um, and, and that number didn't reson doesn't resonate to our customers. But if you called right. the dealer, right, you could, um, 
you know, you, you could figure out what that number meant. Maybe you could look on the internet too and figure out what that number meant. And then you make a decision on whether this is a catastrophic um, code or <laughs> if it's something that you could take a, care of in a few days when you have time or something like that. So, um, you know, the nice thing about the new monitor, one of them is um, the, the diagnostics is in regular plain English. Um, it gives you some indication of, you know, the, the, uh, the urgency of what you need to do to take care of that and make sure that you're not, you know, damaging your machine per se. Um, so that's a great benefit, you know, and also um, there's, more, there's more computing power. So there's some customization. Uh, you know, if a guy is mulching, he definitely wants to always see what the, you know, the hydraulic temperature of his system is, and he might want that to be one of the most important um, things on the main, main runtime screen. So there's some customization like that. But we're, where I'm very proud of um, by providing um, an 8-inch screen um, on these machines, where I'm very proud is we're adding some actual real value, productivity value to a big portion of our customers. So, for example, we, we have a new um, software that comes with it every time you opt for this option. We do, by the way, we'll have a low cost standard um, two and a half inch display, which is better than what we have today. But it's um, it's a, it's more for those customers that aren't really, you know, maybe not doing a lot of um, uh, spending a lot of time in their machine and they're not really using that as the critical piece of their fleet um, to get things mm -hmm. done. They just use it as a complimentary, so they might not want to pay for this. But this is an option, and we have um, some software that will be loaded on it called Attachment Manager Software. And so what I love about this software is um, if a customer pulls up to his cold planer attachment, he can um, put he can go into attachment manager page of the of the monitor and he can click on a 24 a 30 a 40 inch cold planer that he's going to attach to and all of the machine performance attributes will automatically configure to optimize the operation of that cold planer attachment so one great example is when you run a cold planer, you can't drive full speed. You don't want to drive full speed because um, you'll stall out the drum because you're going too fast. So we have creep mode, right? Well, um, um, without attachment manager telling you that um, it's best to run the that attachment, I'm making this up, but to give you an example, it's best to run maybe 5% of max speed with a, a 40 inch cold planer. And, and we know that, so um, we'll recommend that, and um, automatically creep mode will come on um, in, the, in that example. Um, nice. If, if, if um, the attachment requires the boom and bucket speed to be maybe a little bit slower, depending on that attachment, um, you know, we, uh, the, the machine will automatically configure precision mode in terms of our three levels of, of a boom speed that could be, you know, that you could choose from. And so a lot of the, oh, a better example, um, and probably one of the most important examples would be, um, we, have, we have customers that make mistakes, right? And so they might put a low flow attachment on the front of the machine and not really understand what they're um, maybe doing or the capability of that uh, attachment and they'll turn high flow on and so high flow will damage you'll damage the attachment something <laughs> will break and so um, with attachment manager it will always it, uh, it once you um, tell it what um, you're running the um, the machine won't let you turn high flow on on a low flow attachment or it will always turn high flow on when you choose 40 inch cold planer in the attachment manager software. And then if you're running maybe say three different kinds of attachments on a regular basis, the, um, the machine will know the logic that these are the three most common attachments in the list of attachments that are on that machine, you know, in that, in that monitor. And they'll be, yeah. it, it will automatically populate the most commonly run attachments that you have on that machine to come to the top. So you can easily just confirm, yes, I'm running a 40 inch cold planer. All the parameters that we, you know, that were originally populated by us um, will be um, activated. If you, ch if you decided to change our, um, our 
parameters, you can do that as well, but the machine will always remember that from that point on until you change it again. So that's attachment manager. We also are adding onboard grade indication software. And so you know from nice. previous previous um, times together, we, we're pretty heavy into the grade control segment with our equipment today. Um, but one of the entry level forms, a lot of customers just say, you know, I don't really need automation. Um, I don't really want to spend a lot of money to have um, 2D grade control or 3D grade control, but boy, it would be really nice if I could understand what grade I'm on. So as I'm um, trying to get a 3% grade from the backyard to the front yard to have water flow in the direction you want, the, the machine will provide a reference of what that grade is um, on board and um, and it will help the operator know how much more digging or grading he needs to do to get to that 3% grade in that example if he needs it. It's, it's, I, would, I would equate it to something like um, electronic bubble level, you know, um, that you would use to hang a picture or, you know, ha hang something level. And it will tell you that electronically in degrees or in um, percentage. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, those there's several really. I mean, between the attachment manager and that that onboard uh, grade indication software, um, several nice uh, new features with that that eight inch display. Uh, one other thing uh, that would uh, that that eight inch display uh, really comes in handy with is the the new two hundred eighty degree uh, surround view uh, camera system. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, it's a it's a bird's eye camera system, uh, right? Yeah, that that is correct. Um, so um, just to be clear, that they, um, we're running our surround view camera system on a different display um, than, than, oh, okay. than that and, and GPD display. It's a five and a, I believe it's a five and a half inch display. But the reason we're doing that is our customers said, you know, I, I, I want all my runtime screen and all my diagnostic capabilities on one monitor. And then I want a dedicated rear view camera um, that's always on and especially with surround view um, it's you know it's not like we're just backing up and then you want to just see what's behind you that you're yeah. you know, we're going in the tightest of places and so when we did the development um, that was one takeaway customers said you know I, I want it on its own dedicated display and I want to be able to at all times no matter if I'm going forward or backwards be able to see um, things on the sides of the machine um, on the rear corners of the machine, and then directly out the rear of the machine. The front, not so much because they're facing that forward anyway um, a lot of times. So that's why 280 versus 360, the auto industry has, um, you know, examples of 360. Um, but for, for us, um, we, we decided to focus on about a 280 degree perspective to help customers, you know, um, be, be very efficient and safe in the tightest of places where it turns out our our compact equipment goes more often than any other larger piece of equipment in the industry yeah and then uh you know let's we'll, we'll round things out here too kind of talking about uh, uh grade control uh you mentioned kind of with the one of the standard features of that new optional eight inch uh, touchscreen display was the uh the grade indication um, but you know, uh, the 333, uh, the new, the upcoming 333P that, that you've mentioned a couple of times here, uh, and also this new 335P uh, CTL, um, you know, both of these are going to be, uh, 2D grade control ready, um, uh, in, in a couple of different configurations, but then obviously, uh, you'll continue, uh, the, the CTL support for, uh, 3D smart grade. Uh, on the 333 and also bringing it to this new 335. Tell us a little about the implementation of uh, 2D and 3D uh, grade control on uh, both of these new machines. Sure. Yeah, grade indicate, that's another good point is, you know, that's like the, that's like the hook them, you know, guy gets, got, guys, you know, <laughs> start wanting to have, you know, just know what the grade is of the land underneath the tracks or his tires, right? And he's like, oh, that's pretty useful. Um, I think I'm going to upgrade. And so um, our plan for that roadmap basically is like grade control your way. So if you just want a low-cost way to know the lay of the land, we got that. Uh, if you want to upgrade those machines um, to a 2D grade control, which would include 
um, slope control, which, you know, not, now we're talking, um, the blade is starting to do some of the work for you, do the math and make sure, you know, those kind of things. Um, if you were, if you graded a, a slope, I'll just stick with the 3%, but you're grading a side slope and you want 3%, you know, um, it'll tell you that what, when you're at that 3%, as you turn around to do the next pass, um, the blade in is automated. So it'll, it'll turn, the blade will angle to, to be able to be ready to um, cut that same 3% grade as you go the other way. And, and, you know, you can go back and forth, um, if you will, um, you know, and we also offer some of our John Deere um, software that helps manage the blade as the narrow, uh, I would call it the short wheelbase from front to back of a compact piece of equipment isn't as heavy like a dozer. So um, what we do is we have some software that is able to, and, and, and we have IMUs in the mainframe and we have IMUs on our attachments, our dozer blade, and it's able to um, uh, help the operator know that the, that the, the, machine or tracks are coming off grade and adjust the blade faster than you could do it manually. So easy grade is part of that. And then of course the control pattern, if you're running a dozer blade is really important. So um, uh, we offer dozer mode in our great control ready configuration. And that would be the lowest, um, it would be the next level up in price um, versus, the, um, you know, like grade indication, as I mentioned. And if you want to build on that um, uh, 2D with slope control, you want to build on that, you can get 2D with slope control and also easy grade and dozer mode with laser grade control. So now you can go, um, you know, now you can have um, laser um, on your, you know, connected to the machine, uh, very accurate um, when you have laser, you'd have, you know, and, and a lot of guys are using, um, you know, a tripod on their job site. So when they know they get to that grade and so they like laser um, and, and so you can upgrade that, that to that next level of price point and performance. And then lastly, um, 3D, which is GPS. And it doesn't require mass like um, maybe laser does. Um, so if you're not really working indoors or anything where laser has a lot of value for customers, um, you you know you can have massless um, grade control. But you you know that that you need to have line of sight to the satellites um, to be able to get 3D um, in that format. Um, but more importantly. What we know is there's a lot of grade control providers in the industry and our, our consumers of our product already have a relationship and, and maybe even equipment that's configured with um, very, name, uh, very reputable name brands like Topcon. Um, they are, so they don't, they, they want a top con system on a track loader. So if, so if that's the case, we're good because we have top con today with our smart grade yeah. on G series, we're going to have it in the future. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, and then, you know, kind of like the, the kind of cherry on top of all this, obviously is the, the JD link telematics that's on everything you guys build. Um, you know, uh, how important is something like that, you know, as these machines are getting more and more complex, uh, but, but also more capable, uh, those two things kind of go hand in hand. How important is that JD link telematics and, and the way that that is interfacing on, on these new machines? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> there's a lot of gr really good reasons. Um, to to ha stay connected, keep your machines connected, and JD Link is our telematic solution. That's our name for it. Um, it does things like you know everybody knows what telematics can do. Like it could tell you hours and location of the machine. But as um, as we get more sophisticated, customers are wanting um, to know when it's time to do a service interval, like a countdown. Um, you know, as they get close, uh, the dealer can help them there. Um, let's say there's a, let's say, say there's something where we want to um, improve the performance of the machine or update the software of the machine. That can be done remotely with JD Link, obviously. So, so um, there could be remote diagnostics capabilities. There could be, um, you know, avenues for the dealer to provide them alerts that saying it's going to get closer to, it, you're getting closer to your, you know, your 500 hour oil change or thousand hour hydraulic change. Um, you know, let's schedule a visit, um, you know, things like that. There, there, there's other, you know, as we get to things like if you want to map a job site, 
um, to have that connectivity um, through GPS to be able to, I'm, I'm, you know, this is where I see it going in the future, but let's say you want to geofence certain areas of that job site because it's a protected wildlife area and you don't want one of your operators tracking, through, you know, that can all become available. And the, the, the best thing also, I think, one of the most important things for us is when we have our machines connected, we can do pr predictive analytics, right? We can start studying, oh, in this climate, at this altitude, at this temperature, we're seeing this um, diagnostic code alert on um, a machine and it's growing. And so we can create, it, we can understand it better with um, more data, more um, sample size, if you will. And, and we can, um, and we can resolve, we can come up with so solutions and resolve things quicker before customers actually um, potentially could have a, a, a down a failure that would in, incur downtime. And then um, we could have our dealers know about that, know what population may see that same issue at some point in time, and they can schedule downtime in off hours. They can come, you know, they can come to the job site um, take care of whatever work needs to be done in, in the evening or the, de or the customer who owns that machine could schedule a Saturday or whatever day of the week that is the slowest time to get that work done in advance of actually seeing a problem. So uh, a major problem. So, I mean, th th that's where I, I, I think is the most value to our customers of all the other things that could be potentially um, important. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, the, these both of these new machines um, uh, with the with the PT or inclusion of all these, um, you know, these awesome uh, features. You know, beyond the size and everything like that, the the quality that you've come to expect uh, is is still there. Uh, the capability uh, is is greater. The the fuel economy uh, is improved uh, by by twenty percent. Um, th these are both of these new machines are are awesome new packages. Um, and so, uh, you know, kind of to round things out here. Uh, when can we expect to, you know, one of the other things too, that we've talked about several times here is this new 333, uh, P tier that's coming that will replace the, um, the 333, uh, G. Um, so we'll have the 333 P the 334 and the 335 P, uh, coming. When can we expect to, uh, see these machines, uh, hit dealership lots? Yeah. Um, right now we're on schedule. Uh, for um, uh, opening dealers to place their first orders for our machines not too far away in November. So okay. that, that's pretty exciting. And then, um, um, you know, by the time we ramp down G series production and ramp up uh, P, P series production um, and, and change our tooling and, and some of that takes a little time. Um, but um, you can expect to see uh, our started dealer sales date today is scheduled for uh, May of 2020, uh, 2024, May of 2024, where you'll start awesome. seeing these on dealer lots. Well, I know a lot of folks out there are going to be really excited to, uh, to, to get an order in on these machines. So, uh, so yeah, but well, Greg, um, thank you so much for, for taking the time uh, with us uh, and spending some time with Compact Equipment and uh, Machine Heads here. Um, is there anything else uh, that, that you uh, want customers to know about these uh, these three new compact loaders before we sign off? No, um, I think I think we covered it. You know, go, uh, go see your John Deere dealer um, for more information. Um, after November, our dealers will get uh, their first um, information packages uh, with all the more much more detail than I could cover with you. Um, today, Wayne, but um, they'll, they'll be very well equipped. They'll be trained up um, before we go to market. So if you if you want more information, uh, visit your John Deere dealer um, sometime in late November or December of this year, and they'll be um, well prepared to um, help you and answer your question. Awesome. Well, we're I know I know we're excited to see these machines in the field too. So uh, Greg, thank you again for joining us here uh, on Machine Heads and uh, talking about these new machines, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet, Wayne.